into our workshop, which is themed identity and belonging. So what will we see today? The young generation of Irish and European citizens of mixed backgrounds are challenging the current notion of identity and belonging based on the concept of ethno ethnostate. This workshop will host young activists discussing what strategies they are implementing while working on leading a public discussion on the issue of identity and belonging. So the first thing we're going to see is what does I can't breathe mean in Greece? Second, the Black and Irish podcast. And third, Rooted in Africa and Ireland. So just as a reminder, if you have any questions, please leave them in the Q&A box and I'll be directing them to our speakers at the end. And please make sure your questions are respectful and constructive. Thank you. So we would like to welcome our first speaker, Irene Antu, born and raised in Athens, Greece with African roots from Kenya and Uganda. She has a past in human rights activism and a mission to find new ways to positively impact the society she lives in. So Irene, you have our attention. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me here once again, uh, Jennifer, and for the beautiful introduction. Well, um, I'd like to just brief you a bit to my background and what I've been working on currently. Uh, well, as, uh, as you already mentioned, uh, yes, I have a background in uh, activism, volunteering. I started back in 2009, uh, as well as when I joined uh, Amnesty International. And uh, I worked with a group that was dealing with the immigrant and refugee crisis uh, and re refugee rights at the time. Uh, it's, um, it's a group that has been always um, been busy because we're, we're situated in the Mediterranean Basin, which is the main port of, uh, of entrance for many, uh, many refugees and many immigrants uh, across uh, Asia and, uh, and Africa. So we focused on that part there. And I uh, gradually uh, got to know the members of uh, the Generation 2.0. Actually, at the time, it didn't even have a name. So I was there when they were taking their baby steps. And I left just before it became an official NGO. Uh, this NGO uh, basically lobbied for the introduction of uh, various reforms uh, that helped to uh, create uh, a process uh, uh, that uh, helped to create the legislation uh, to help uh, persons of second generation uh, acquire their documents, acquire a Greek passport. And it was something that was not the case up until that time. Uh, up until that time, you had to follow the standard naturalization process that any immigrant that uh, arrives in Greece uh, when they are an adult has to follow. So it was really a uh, really peculiar uh, st state that we had to go through. Uh, luckily, uh, this organization along with others, actually this was a flexible organization that helped to create right now and draft uh, the, this, uh, the right legislation um, and has created, has laid the basis uh, for, for more laws to come. Of course, there are many moves, many improvements that need to be made, but still uh, it has uh, set uh, uh, an example. Now, what do I do now? Um, well, along with my, my partner in crime, Jackie, a willing man, uh, we, had, uh, we started curating and helping with the production of a series of discussions uh, targeting the Greek public, but not only. Um, and uh, these discussions are now available on the on NASA's foundation uh, channel on YouTube, also with English subs if you if you want to to get a, a quick view. Uh, our starting point and goal was to educate and bring forward young people of various backgrounds and uh, that were normally underrepresented in the media. So we placed our focus there because we firmly believe that when by putting a face into a, a topic, you make every issue more relevant and more understandable. 
So um, we created this, uh, we started discussing about it, but to be honest, our triggering point were the events that occurred last springtime and summertime in the United States with uh, the murder of uh, George Floyd. So this basically this triggered us to form uh, and, and draft a more specific way to approach this in an educational way. And um, what we did was first to create, to gather people uh, of African descent um, that we were familiar with. And we thought that they had something to say uh, just to discuss how the anti-blackness sentiment, which we believe is global and has been perpetuated by the way the United States also portrays black bodies uh, across the world. Uh, so we wanted to see how this, in, how this has been, has, how this has impacted uh, our experiences here in Greece, so many kilometers away. And uh, we lost the discussion, then Afro-Greeks discussed what, are the, what does I can't breathe mean in Greece. And um, after that, uh, because we got many comments about the decision to describe ourselves as Afro-Greeks, we decided that the best way to continue that is by launching another discussion, uh, which aired last week, and is uh, also titled Eight Young People Discuss Cultural Identity and the Concept of Belonging. So this is why I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Irene, for that. And if anybody has any questions to her, please leave in the Q&A box. Thank you. So we would like to welcome our second speaker, Femi Banko, who has lived in Ireland for over 20 years and grew up in Dundalk. He is the son of two Nigerian migrants. He co-founded Black and Irish, a social platform aimed at celebrating the success and highlighting the struggles of Black and Irish people. So Femi, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be here and to be speaking to all of you. As Jennifer nicely said, I'm from an organization or a social platform called Black and Irish. And again, as she said, I'll repeat, we're aimed at celebrating successes of Black and mixed race Irish people and also highlighting their struggles. Before I tell you more about our platform and what we do, I'll tell you a little bit of myself. Um, so I grew up, so I was born in Nigeria. Um, but I grew up in Ireland, I uh, grew up in Dundalk. Um, I am of Yoruba, Nigerian descent, and I grew up, even though I was in Ireland when I grew up, I grew up very much so in an African home. I think my, my parents made it their, their duty to make sure that our cultures were, were was, was really, really impressed um, upon me when growing up. And that um, led to quite a, a different and unique experience growing up in Ireland. Um, you know, I grew up in an African home, a home, but outside I was experiencing much more different and much more westernized uh, experiences. Now, um, a bit about our platform, just listen to Irene speak there um, and think, talk about the inception of her movement and her platform. That's very, very similar to um, how Black and Irish were founded. We as well were founded as a result of the civil rights movements, you could call it now, um, in America last summer. Um, but we were, we were finding for a very much different purpose. Um, I still remember to this very day, um, marching out to the streets of, of uh, Dublin, um, mid pandemic, the height of the pandemic, you can say last summer. And um, remembering the discourse afterwards, online discourse afterwards in the media, and you know, the backlash you could argue as to, you know, what are you doing? Why is I marching? This is an American problem. This doesn't exist in Ireland. And um, myself and two of my very good mates, um, we sat down that week and we were talking and um, we shared a few stories that are of our experiences with each other. And what we realized is that as black people, black mixed race people in Ireland, we've never spoken to each other about our experiences. And we felt that, you know what, maybe it was time for us to let the Irish public know um, what was like, what it is like um, being a black person um, in Ireland. And that was how um, our um, social platform organization was founded, um, which is Black and Irish. And it, it resides on um, social media. And the main thing that we do is we, we 
share our experiences through storytelling. So we have Black and mixed race people um, in Ireland who share their different stories of their experiences, positive or negative, of growing up in Ireland. Um, so you can pop onto our Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, even for the younger people in the audience to see some of these stories. And um, over the last, I think, eight, nine months of sharing these stories, there is a lot of common themes and trends that you could, you could see come out, of, come out of this. And there was three main ones that we saw. And those three were identity, hope, Sorry, identity, racism, and hope. Racism in the term, which was most common on team, uh, we've had people from all who grew up in so many different decades, from the 60s to you know, little, you know, 10, 12 year olds sharing their stories. And they've all faced very similar experiences um, and grew up in Ireland, especially on the topic of racism. And that was whether it was racism in the school environment, racism in the community, you know, playgrounds, public transport interacting with different services or the different um, you know, microaggressions that black people or black and mixed race people face on a daily basis, such as, you know, where you're really from, you speak really good English, little pieces of, you know, covert racism that we experience on a daily basis that really do have a profound effect on your sense of identity and on your sense of, of belonging, um, as this session is very much themed on. The second thing that the second trend that we find mostly was around um, identity, whether it's you know having your Irishness um, challenged and or rejected by others, the feelings of lack of representation in different areas of society, feeling like an outsider in your own home. That trend was really strong across a lot of the stories, and then most maybe one that I align with um, a lot, which was you know the identity crisis within the black and mixed race community growing up in Ireland in this quasi environment of, you know, being engorged in your African culture, but also yearning to really, really delve into your Irish, your Irishness, because this is where you grew up and so this is all you know. So that was kind of where we were over the summer and where we are now staring, sharing stories. But our next steps and what we're trying to do now is move the conversation on from, okay, you know, we shared our stories, these are experiences, and it's more, what can we do to make Ireland a more inclusive place for everyone, especially for black and mixed race people. And during our next steps, we're working, you know, on focused on loads of different collaborations, working with different companies and organizations, um, doing talks like this. Um, and, and even, and that brings us on, as Jennifer said, to, to, to our podcast. We, we um, collaborated with RTE and we've created the, the Black and Irish podcast, uh, which was um, a ten was is uh, a ten, we just finished season one, um, a ten part series of podcasts, and where we you know really delve into a, a multitude of topics on on what it is to grow up Black and Irish in, in Ireland, what it is to grow, grow up Black and Irish. Um, luckily, we've actually been commissioned for a season two, so that'll be coming soon to you guys, you know, over over the summer. And where we delve into more fantastic things on the Irish identity, the Black and Irish identity, and really, really focus on educating on um, the, the Irish public on, and, and in hope of building a more cohesive, inclusive, conclusive Irish society. So that's, that's a bit about me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Femi, for that. Um, that was brilliant. And now we would like to welcome our third speaker, Diane Ihirwi, who is an African Irish social worker, speaker, writer, social justice seeker. Diane is part of various organizations and communities that empowers migrants and women in particular. She's also the co-founder of Rooted in Africa and Ireland. So Diane, you have our attention. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, um, so my name is Diane and I'm from Dublin. Um, I'm a social worker, as Jennifer said. So I'm also uh, a co-founder of Rooted in Africa in Ireland. Um, so our network um, started in November 2019. And we started after there was a death in our community. A young mixed race girl died by suicide in Ireland. And the root of, of her bullying was racism. Racism was behind um, her death, basically. 
and when she died um the country was saddened by the you know the the event itself and you know everyone was sad but there was no action plan going forward um, and that wasn't the first death by suicide um, within the black community or the mixed race community and so myself and Joy and Kangare, we just got in touch and for me it wasn't enough that the country was sad it wasn't enough that you know everyone was sending their condolences but the next morning, the world was going to go back to its, you know, everyday life. Um, because I knew that wasn't the first death of suicide, I knew that wasn't the last either. So we put our head together and we said, what can we do? Like, what can we do to see a change? Because um, in Ireland, there's a lot of support in terms of anti-racism. On the macro level, there, there's loads of people doing amazing work, um, changing legislation, a framework. On the macro level, there's a lot of help and, and good work being done there. But there's nothing on the micro level. There was nothing being offered to people facing racism. There was nothing offered to families um, about you know, how to deal with identities and belonging in the new culture. There was nothing on a one-to-one -one basis being done. And as a social worker, um, my job revolves around supporting people, giving people the hands-on support. And I saw that was lacking in the Irish community. So we got together, myself and Joy and I, and some amazing um, people behind us. And that was the beginning of Rutledge in Africa and Ireland. And who we are, um, as, a, as a legacy of slavery and as a legacy of colonialism, being rooted in Africa isn't just people who came from Africa. Being rooted in Africa are people from the Americas, from the Caribbean, from Australia, anybody with melanin, for some reason, you can trace your race, you can trace your, your beginning in Africa. This is the space for people like that. So what we offer is, um, we operate on three pillars, knowledge, empowerment, and representation. So what we do in knowledge is that we bring people together uh, we work from, uh, there's a, Monica William who said that ethnic identity is inherently a social event. So we provide social events for people to learn about who they are, about their identity, about how they can, you know, a mixture of being African and Irish. And as Femi said, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of contradiction, there's a lot of confusion between, especially young people, um, who they don't really know, are they African? Are they Irish? And there's a lot of research out there that proves and show that people of a 1.5 generation or second generation or third generation, we go through a lot of finding ourselves and finding who we are. And oftentimes there is no space specifically to cater for that confusion, to cater for your life, to cater for that journey. So that's who we are. We are a space and we offer a brave and um, confident space for people to come and meet each other and know each other. And so far we've had a few, um, a few events going on online and our goal is to meet in person down the line. But for now we've had a few sessions. We have uh, what we call the gathering, uh, again, going back into the African history of meeting together and gathering together into one space and talking about the things that are happening, the good and the bad, and talking into one umbrella. So we have the gathering. We have, um, we provide what we call safe spaces where people meet and talk about whatever is, that's happening. We have um, uh, nine social workers, psycho psych psychologists, psychotherapists, social care workers that are offering one-on-one -on -one support into those safe spaces. We also have what we call the youth, um, Support, support corner as well, which is a space between, for kids between 13 and 18, where they sit down again and talk. And they're not just the black kids, they are just kids. They are just young people sitting together and talking about whatever they wanna talk about, supported by, um, supported by uh, professionals. But that's what we do. We provide in that space to learn and be together. And also um, on the pillar of knowledge, we provide um, training uh, in schools, training in organizations, training within our community online and elsewhere, because we do believe that it, it is only by changing the narrative of what it means to be African, 
changing the narrative of what people see Africa, can we really move forward? Um, that's on the knowledge pillar. We also have um, empowerment pillar where, as I said, our children, are, they don't see anybody who look like them on TV. They don't see anybody who look like them in the books. Um, the narrative they have of Africa is negative. Therefore, you know, they, they reach a stage where they deny their Africanness to wanting to fit into spaces, to wanting to look the same as their Irish peers. They deny the, the very important part of who they are being African. So we offer um, through empowerment programs, to, through bodying programs, we offer spaces where we link in somebody who's done amazing work to a young person, where they can show them, you know what, I'm, um, I'm an engineer. You know, I, I went through the same life as you did, but here I am, you can do it too. So we offer that space on a one-on-one -on -one or, or as a group to our young people to show them that yes, you can be African and you can be Irish. It's up to you to choose, but we want you to have the knowledge of what it means. We also, our third pillar of representation, where we are urging, um, we are urging um, institutions, we are urging organizations to provide representation for people of African descent. We want to see blackness represented from all pillars of organizations, not just on the bottom layer. We want to see blackness represented going all, um, all over the ladder because only by black people being on the table and making decisions that will affect black people can we see change in terms of identity and representation. So that's who we are. As I said, we provide um, a holistic support for people of African descent and we operate on knowledge, empowerment and representation. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Diane. Um, we will now be taking your questions and I'll be directing them to our speakers. So let's see what questions we have here. We have a question from Ken, which I believe is to Femi. Um, it says, in the Black and the Irish, do you find that people of mixed ethnic backgrounds are specifically targeted for racist abuse? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think one of um, my colleagues that I founded, um, Black and Irish Wish, um, is, is of mixed race. And just from speaking to him, I get really close to him over the past year or so, I, I realized there's a further layer of discrimination and racial abuse that people of mixed race actually, actually face, um, whether it's from, you know, white people, but they also face discrimination themselves from, you know, people within the Black community. And that, you know, gives an even further layer into, you know, the issues and the struggles that they have with their identity and with the, with the, with the abuse that they, that they would face. So, so yes, um, people of mixed race, mixed ethnicities do, do unfortunately get um, specifically targeted for um, racist abuse. Thank you. Uh, we have another question here. Um, it says, excellent presentations. How would you advise us in the North further raise awareness, um, referring to anti-racism campaigning by young Black people? Anyone who wants to answer that? Diane? Um, yeah, I think um, anti-racism campaign is really across board. And um, it's about including people who have uh, who have the anti-racism um, agenda to mind, not just black people, not just white people, because I like to remind people that it's not a black against white movement. It's not a black against white fight. It's about everyone fighting against racism. So I would definitely suggest or uh, advise to gather everyone who's got the anti-racism fight um, into their heart and work together. And um, I think unity has to be the, 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 the goal, really, working together to fighting this system of anti-racism, this system of racism, but you have to work together, absolutely. Thank you. Um, now, a question to Irene. Um, what has been 
your biggest challenge and your biggest achievement in finding your identity and belonging? Well, uh, I think basically what Femi described, it's really similar to my experience and to the experience of many people that are of immigrant descent here in Greece what he described the, the challenges of trying to fit in and feeling like an outsider on your own home. And the fact that um, Greece is a really homogenous society and color does, does matter. Uh, there have been people, actually the African uh, population here is not as, as, uh, as fast as other populations of uh, for coming from other countries. Um, but uh, as, the, as the time goes by, but even though it has not been the vast, one of the oldest actually, uh, but still uh, as the time go, goes by, or most of the other immigrant populations have been able to integrate much faster than the ones that have uh, that come from African countries. And uh, I believe uh, that one of the main reasons is the fact that you, you can just stand out. In the end of the day, you stand out color-wise and <laughs> complexion-wise. So yes, I think that this has actually affected my sense of belonging. And it still affects my sense of belonging to this day. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there is a question to Diane uh, from Graham Clifford. So there are actually two questions. Uh, he says, can I ask if you are lobbying for proper button up support on the micro level in the national integration strategy being renewed later this year? Yes, we are. Um, we are working with um, um, a few lawyers down in Galway and we're asking for an um, anti-racism um, policy within schools and a national on a national level so yes we are asking so and the second question is there any example in irish society where identity especially based on appearance and race is a non-issue or at least less prevalent is that Dan? for me or yes for me? sorry that's the second question Dan. um i think if I, if I answer that question as a black woman, I'm gonna say no, because the first thing somebody sees when I enter a room is my blackness. Um, my expertise, my qualification really are second. The first thing they see is how I look. So I definitely think um, my physical appearance affects my identity everywhere I go and therefore affects my belonging. Um, yeah, I don't know, Femi, if you have another answer, but I think it definitely does affect because being black, I cannot hide that I'm not um, from here, quote unquote. Um, so therefore my blackness comes first before anything else. Yeah, and, and, and I also think, I think it's a question you have to be very careful in answering because, you know, yeah. I myself or Diane, we don't speak for all black people. And, you know, based off my own experiences and, you know, the different people and places I've encountered, I would say that, yes, my race does, does play a part in all my encounters. I, I can see it, I, I've experienced it, but that might not be necessarily the case for Irene, for example. So I think it's very difficult. It's, it's a personal question that's based off your own personal experiences. And that's the best way you can answer that question. Um, we have a question to Femi and Diane from Molly. From working with young people and based off your own experience in school, what do you think Ireland could do to make the education system more inclusive? Oh, wow, okay. Um, that's a great question and a very multi-layered question because there's, there's quite a lot you can do. Um, where, where do I start? Okay, um, I always like to go um, by, by the motto that um, if you don't see it, you can't be it or you can't encompass it. And I felt like, um, growing up in Ireland and going through the education system in Ireland, I never felt that my experiences were, um, were relevant when I, was, when I was being, were taken, sorry, were taken into consideration based on material I was taught. 
So let's say, you know, we're, we're teaching people by different cultures. There wasn't necessarily any representation for black people. Let's say we're te teaching people by history, for example. Unfortunately, as, as a black person, the only part of our history or black history that was represented was um, the negative part or we're talking about slavery. Um, and, and in terms of what, what we could do better, I think it's, it's, it's an easy answer. And that's obviously to make, make way for a more inclusive and di diverse curriculum. And not, not just inclusive and diverse, just in relation to black people, in relation to all people from all different cultures, you know, Ireland, is a place, especially over the last 20, 30 years, that is so diverse and so multicultural. And I think our education system has to you know, make space to reflect the society that we live in today. And whether it's exposing our children um, to different societies and cultures from an early age, and by exposing children and young minds to different societies, to different cultures, to different parts of history, to a wider range, that actually goes a long way to combating um, different racial prejudices and you know some some passions thoughts because you're you're not you're you're more exposed to people being different you're more exposed to different people of different being of different races and then you're you're less likely to exhibit you know xenophobic behavior so the importance of that cannot be understated and the only way to do that is by diversifying the curriculum and um, enabling the young minds to be filled with broad broader um, experiences Thank you. Um, our next question is to Irene um, from Sophia. She says, what similarities or differences do you see between the Greek and Irish societies? What learns could we learn from each other? Um, Uh, I was actually some time ago because I had uh, um, had I had spent some time with some uh, with an Irish group. Surprisingly, there are many similarities that were mostly brought forward by during the economic crisis that we experienced uh, uh, over the last decade. Uh, there were many organizations here in Greece, not only organizations but people that wanted to create this uh, bridge. Uh, from Greece to Ireland. So this is when it became a bit more, I, I, I was a bit more, um, I became more familiar, familiarized with, uh, with the culture there. Um, I would say, I, I can say that there are many similarities uh, that are based on the, on the strong attachment to culture, um, which is something that also Greece has and strong attachment to religion. So um, this can create barriers when um, our people come from uh, different backgrounds and want to uh, participate in a society. Not that religion on its own uh, has uh, creates an issue, not all the attachment to culture creates an issue, but the fact that um, um, you have a society that has a really sense of identity and how they view uh, themselves uh, in contrast to the rest of the world. Um, cannot um, it, it, it's it's uh, the direct the direct effect of that is that everything viewed as other um, has to go through certain processes to be considered integrated. Now, uh, what was the second part of the question? There was a second part, I think. I'm from here, sorry. I'm sorry? It's gone from here. Um, sorry. <laughs> if, it, if it does come back, I'll ask you again. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, we have a question to Diane uh, from Mary. Would you use drama with these young people to explore their identity freely? Absolutely. And we um, we had one session and in the youth um, support corner where we use drama and it was it was it was yeah a very success. Um, it's funny because every time we had those spaces, the young people were just themselves for so all the facilitators left the spaces crying because I think we forgot um, 
it's been a long time since I was 13 and I, I didn't realize that the very thing I'm experiencing as a 29 year old woman the 13 year old kids are experiencing the same thing being othered being uh, rejected being uh, picked on so I definitely think anything you can use um, to engage children to allow them to talk to allow them to explore whatever they are facing is definitely welcomed and art is one of the, the a few things that you can use that everyone can get involved in. So absolutely, I think art is one of the biggest tools to use. Thank you very much. Um, now a question to Femi um, from Iya. So how, how would you advise multiracial or biracial people around creating the balance between fitting in or standing out without getting conflicted in every situation? Well, that's a, that's, that's a difficult question as well. Um, um, again, this is something that's very personal to you. It's very personal to your upbringing and your, and your different experiences. So I, 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 can only, I, I can only say as to, you know, how I dealt with it and how I am still dealing with my, with my, with my identity. I think a lot of it does come with age as well. And I always look back at my younger self and be like, oh man, if only you knew that now. And, and that comes around, you know, whether it's self-confidence, whether it's like, okay, I don't, I don't need to fit in. This is me. I am Femi, I am Nigerian, and I'm really buying into my Nigerian culture, but I'm also Irish and I love all the aspects of Irish. I actually think having being dual, I having sorry, being of dual heritage is fantastic because I can be like, Here's all the great things I like by being Nigerian. I'm gonna take all that. And here's all the great things by being Irish. I'm gonna take all that and, and bring it together. And it really gives you, you, you know, a real sense of um, uniqueness and a real sense of confidence in, in who you are. Unfortunately, it's I, I suppose that doesn't actually answer your question because <laughs> that's based on my own personal experience. And I, I suppose what I'm trying to say is it's it's unique to each person based on their interactions based on how quickly they mature and, and based on you know self-confidence and I think what we can do as a society is is normalize you know being of different identities is normalize you know or maybe maybe try to try to eradicate discrimination and abuse based off of, of your identity and in that sense we can we can go a long way in alleviating some of the issues people face with, with their identity. Thank you. Um... We have a question from Marie. What do the panelists have, do the panelists have any advice to give to community organizations about what the most valuable initiatives or approaches to take are in terms of supporting and developing effective integration? I do have a quick answer to this one, actually. Go ahead. Um, I think it's actually very, very, very simple. So you're, you're talking about like, what organizations can do for the communities in terms of um, developing effective, effective integration, just ask them, speak to the people, speak. I can, you can't ask me, it's like, hey, Femi, what's the best way to represent this group of black people living down in Cork? Well, they, they, know, they, know, they know what's best for them. They know what issues they're facing. And I think we, we need to maybe step away from te um, treating the issues of race or issues around race as, as a monolith. Um, Black people, people of color, people of different identities are different, diverse, have different points of views. And if you really, really want to, you know, effectively integrate any group, you need to really, really engage with that group. And in the world we live in, that, that means you need to, develop, you, know, uh, you know, give time to it, give resources to it. And that might not always necessarily be there, but the easiest and the best way to do is go directly to the source that you're trying to affect ask them, engage them, and not just ask and engage them, be like, okay, we'll take that away. Work alongside them to really, really, you know, bring to life, you know, answers to their issues and really help them feel included within your organization or community. Any thoughts on that, Diane or Irene? Oh, I absolutely agree because, um, for example, I like to give this analogy. If I told you guys I have a party tomorrow, right? And I tell you, you're all invited. I'm, I'm including you in my party. I mean, I'm inviting you. So there'll be a diversity in my party tomorrow. 
But if I tell you to come in but, and I don't plan on ways to include you into my party tomorrow, although your presence will be there, although the, there will be um, a multitude of difference in my home, if I didn't really plan on ways to include you individually, my party is in vain. My diverse uh, party is non-existent. There's no point to it. So I definitely agree with Femi. If you want um, an integration that's really holistic, ask people. Yes, invite them, but ask them, ask them as well, well, how can we work together? Don't just do things for people, but do things with people. And that's the only way to see results. Any thoughts on that, Irene? I actually completely agree. Um, I think that the main issue with the different um, approaches that we have seen uh, in different countries as well, uh, on volunteering and NG with NGOs, is that they mostly have a really paternalistic approach. Uh, they show up and just dictate what needs to be done, uh, judging from um, what they assume that needs to be done uh, from what they have read on their course books or what they have been taught in their universities and schools. But this does not really apply necessarily. You need to have um, the feeling, the, um, the opinions of the persons that uh, will be on the receiving end, let's say, of what you, what's the, of the project that you're running. So I totally agree with uh, both Femi and uh, Diane. They've completely covered, uh, covered beyond this. I think the phrase is um, diversity is being um, invited to the party, whereas inclusion is being asked to dance. So I think that maybe encompasses it, <laughs> the answer you're looking for there. Yes, I really like the example that Diane used. I think that most people, like when they discuss about diversity, they say, okay, um, I'll just uh, have the, this event or this project and I'll just handpick people from different races and different backgrounds just to ensure that I'm uh, well-rounded and uh, uh, a citizen of the world. Uh, but they usually do that without even checking the backgrounds, checking what is right or, or wrong, checking even what the other people that, might have, that they might have invited in this kind of um, situations that might offend or might mistreat the ones that you have invited to include them, let's say. So it's a huge, it's a huge discussion. I don't want to get into it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, a question from Neve. The question of what does it mean to be Irish was raised early today, and it's not something that is easily defined. Can I ask the panelists how how they would answer this question from the perspective of someone who is multicultural? Um, that actually falls a lot into what we're trying to um, challenge here at Black and Irish. Um, what does it mean to be Irish? I think if, if we step back a hundred years or we go to other countries and ask them, you know, what is the stereotypical Irish person? Are you get given, given an image? And I think what we're trying to challenge here uh, in Black and Irish is, you know, general Irish society have an idea, an identity of what it is to be Irish. But I myself, I'm also Irish, and I have an idea, my ideology of what it means to be Irish. And unfortunately, what I faced growing up is that my ideology of what it means to be Irish is rejected by wider Irish society, which isn't necessarily correct. And I think the um, the, cor the correct, sorry, my computer is about to restart. I hope it doesn't, <laughs> let me just get rid of it. Sorry, it should be okay. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Um, and, I, and I think, sorry, lost my train of thought there. Um, uh, what does it mean to be Irish? Oh yes, gotcha. And what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that if, my, my ideology of what it means to be Irish isn't necessarily wrong. What we're trying to fight is that what it means to be Irish varies per person. And because what my, what, what my what, what I think it is to be Irish, if it doesn't meet yours, doesn't mean necessarily mean it's wrong. It just means it's different based off my own experiences. I you know I love being Irish. For me, what it is to be Irish is you know having the crack, being laid back, being easygoing, 
um, lo- being really patriotic and loving of my country, loving of nature, and being really feeling a sense of pride and affinity to this country when I go abroad. But that not, might not necessarily be what it means to be Irish to Diane. But because we have conflicting views of what it means to be Irish, that doesn't mean that my view of what it is to be Irish has, been, has to be invalidated. And I think that's something we're fighting very hard to make sure that our views of what it is to be Irish is not invalidated by wider Irish society, or it's not, sorry, not invalid, is accepted by wider Irish society. I think it's a better, better way of saying it. I agree, Sorry, Timmy. <laughs> no, I agree. Um, because the one thing I often say is that being Irish is not synonymous with being white. I think yeah. we have to understand that first, you know, first of all. And it's funny because every time I go abroad, for example, I was in Spain uh, like two summers ago. And with my sister, we were talking in Swahili in a pub, in, in, in an Irish pub. And some English people came to us and they're like, are you speaking Irish? And we're like, yeah. And that was the end of it. We were speaking Swahili, but to them, because we told them that we're Irish, no one really questioned it. My Irishness is only ever questioned when I'm in Ireland. If I leave Ireland and I tell people I'm Irish, nobody ever questions it. So, um, so as Femi said, being Irish to me is when I go to you know, whatever country, I look for that Irish pub, I look for the Irish spaces, I look for the Irish uh, places because to me that's home. And when I leave Ireland, I miss home. So being Irish, um, as Femi said, it's quite a broad um, topic and it's quite a big spectrum. And as long as you have the love for Ireland, you should really be Irish. And there's not one way to be Irish, I think. Thank you. I'm sorry, may, may I actually comment on that? Uh, Do, please. Um, this is a really common question also in Greece. I know that this is something that the question was best, specifically targeting the, the, the Irish uh, panelists. But I find it quite inappropriate. Why do you have to um, place someone in the position to claim um, their citizenship somewhere? Why do you have to place someone in the position to, to claim their cultural identity? They can, that can be whatever they want. They don't have to discuss this with you. They don't have to share this with you. Um, when if, and this question is usually uh, placed to people that look that they don't um, derive from the traditional ancestry of the place that we're having this discussion. So if you are in Ireland and you look black or you look Asian, then this discussion, this question will be posed to you. But um, do you actually ask this, this question to uh, white Irish people? What, uh, what does it mean to be Irish? And what if they uh, respond that, no, when they go abroad, they do not look for the Irish parts. When I go abroad, I don't care what uh, the Greek places uh, uh, where I visit. I go abroad because I want to see the other places. I mean, you don't have to claim that. And I think that this is the root of the problem. Because we're living in a globalized world. There there has been immigration since the beginning of planet Earth. And um, for some reason, the, um, you might have, example, David that lives right now in Ireland and they have an Irish ancestry, but do they really know where they're coming from? Just because uh, so, as, as, so, as far as they know, they have an Irish ancestry. I'm sorry, I, I get a really a, a bit upset, but this actually was the topic of discussion, the discussion that we actually had and aired last week. Why do you even have to claim that? The end, sorry. <laughs> well, that's okay. Um... So to all of you, um, based on the vast experience all of you have, if you were to give a piece of encouragement to those who are unsure of their identity and belonging, what would you say? Um, Yeah, I I can can go first. Um, I think when I think of my own um, identity, I always feel like I, I, I came into my identity too late in my life. And I think about like my formative years versus my, my teenage years or like my early twenties. And I was like, why was I so proud to be black? Why was I so proud to be Irish? And I, the only piece of advice I, I'd give is when you're younger, really read into your, your roots, your history, delve into the knowledge and really get to know who you are. As in, 
they'll develop, sorry, give time and effort into figuring out who you are. And that, that will serve you a, a, a long way in various issues, whether it's around identity, whether it's around race, whether it's around whatever challenges you, you face in life. If you're, if you're sure of yourself, who you are as, as a person, where you come from, you've built strong foundations there to be able to tackle anything in life, especially your identity. So I, I think put some time into figuring out yourself at, at a young age. Thank you. Um, absolutely, I agree as well. And um, I love that saying that ethnic identity is a social event. I, I think like Femi, I went through a phase of hating who I was because the noise around me um, and it was all in my 20s that I just, I developed the love of being black and being African and being whatever it is. So I think I definitely advise people to remember that it's a journey. You know, you don't have to be a certain way to, you don't have to acclaim your identity at a certain age. It is a journey and surround yourself with people who see the world like you do um, because those people will be needed someday. So just, just, it's a journey to find your identity and be proud of who you are, whatever you are, be proud of, be proud of it. But remember, there's no destination. It's always gonna be a journey along the way, so. Diarini, thank you, Diane. Um, indeed, uh, it's, uh, there's no end destination in my opinion. And I think that um, for me, there was no point of realization. I, I don't believe that. Let me start over. Yeah. Um, I believe that we should not be afraid to claim what we believe is close to our hearts and close to our ideals and close to the way to the to the person that we want to become. Um, so, if uh, your identity, the the identity that the identity that you want to have, is closer to, um, I don't know, uh, uh, somewhere else, then go seek that. I'm not uh, encouraging people to appropriate things, but stay true to yourself in that sense. Um, I, we don't have, we don't have, um, we're not trees, we don't have roots. We can move, we can, we can move mentally and physically. So I think that this is the starting point. And um, this will, I think that this notion can literally free us free us from these discussions, actually. Not in a bad way, not that it's bad that we're having this discussion, but the fact that there is still need to have these discussions. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'm afraid our time is up and we need to conclude. We would like to thank our three speakers who have done a brilliant job. Um, thanks very much for all the effort you put into it. And also our audience for listening attentively and participating. We got many questions here, but I couldn't um, ask them all. Um, and today we saw uh, strategies that our speakers are implementing while working on leading a public discussion on the issue of identity and belonging. And our net, next session will be tomorrow the 16th from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. And for more information, you can access the following website, www.immigrantcouncil.ie. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having us. Bye. Thank you very much, bye. Bye. Thank you so much. You've done an amazing job and I'll be